our first questions, and they go up and down in terms of popularity. <laughs> what a weird thing, popularity. Uh, in terms of uh, people who are voting the questions up or down, here's the first one, John. How does one differentiate between a spiritual demonic attack or natural forces? In other words, natural sickness, etc. How does one know by which he or she is afflicted? Hmm. Yeah. Do you have an easier question? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they, they voted down the harder question yeah. uh, about empirical existence for demons and scientific lab things. So, so okay. they, they, they're trying to give you a break right I'll, now, John. I'll, that's I will uh, stick that's, with the first that's question. down there now to fifth or something. <laughs> yeah. Normally, the question that gets asked along this line is how, how can we, di how can we um, discern between, for example, an attack of Satan or a demon on us? and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but that's, you can't answer your question. You, you no, need to I, answer I, I the, this I'm, question. I was just saying that that's, that's part of my role here on this. That's the question that normally gets asked. Okay, but. so if you want to ask that question and vote it up, that's what he'd really like to answer, yeah. but yeah. We'll, we'll try to stick you with this. You want me to read it again? No, I, I think I, under, <laughs> I, under, I understand stand it. I'm not sure if I can answer it thir thoroughly. Um, I, I think I have a degree of dis discernment, but I don't know if I have a, a gift in that area. But... It's interesting, um, tomorrow uh, um, we'll read from Luke chapter 6, and in Luke chapter 6 there's a reference to Jesus healing people of their diseases, and that those who were troubled by evil spirits, he cured them. And there are some instances in the Gospels, as a matter of fact, I think there are four of the stories where Jesus casts out demons, where the demons actually bring a physical illness. Uh, you think of the story in Act, uh, Luke chapter 13, you have the woman uh, who Jesus refers to as a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for thir eight, 18 years, and she, she was bent over, like literally physically bent over, um, and couldn't stand, and it, it's, it, it says in the New International Version, she was crippled by a spirit. Um, and in other translations, it says she had a spirit of infirmity, illness. So, and then you have people who were blind, and you have people who were, were deaf, uh, they were mute, um, couldn't speak, and it was because of demons. So, demons, in some cases, can actually cause physical ailments. Um, but on the other hand, I think the gospel writers distinguish between healing and those who have illnesses from spirits. There's, a, there's clearly a, dif a differentiation there. And the reason why I quoted from Luke is because Luke was a, doc a doctor, and Luke seems to be more interested in the miracles of Jesus, especially the, the miracles that pertain to people's health, because as a doctor, he was quite intrigued by what was going on. And, um, but Luke is the one who tells us this story in Luke 13 and differentiates clearly between an illness that comes from a demon and illness that just comes from natural reasons. So um, how, how, how do we discern that? Well, Jesus didn't have a problem doing that. He knew. Of course, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the gifts of the Spirit were seen in the Lord, the Lord Jesus in terms of discerning and so on. But um, I think if, if, uh, if an individual has an illness and there's also some, th th that individual is aware that there is some kind of a connection that they have had to the spirit world in the past in a negative sense, then they should be asking the questions about that and praying that the Lord will make that very, very clear. And I think that as others gather to pray, it will become clear. And then you can deal with it as a demon and not as an illness. So, so I get to ask sort of... To, a follow-up, sure. Yeah, with, with that question. So uh, would you first begin with... Uh, uh, doing an exorcism or with yeah. asking them to seek a doctor? I think that's partly what's at yeah. the, with the, work with the question. What's, no, I, how do you, what's the order that you do that? Would you all, yeah. usually begin with the demonic or would you begin with the medical condition? No, I would, I, would, I would begin with the medical condition. And if for some reason it stays for a period of time, then, then I, think, I think it would be an appropriate thing to begin to think about, about the demonic. Yeah. And... Um, I think, I think when, we, when we pray, and especially when we pray with a team of people, um, things become, become clear. There are people who begin to discern things. And um, if you understand the spiritual history of an, in, an individual, 
some of these illnesses that come from demons may have been in the family line for years. And, uh, and so that would be an indication of, okay, this, this might have a spiritual root and not a physical root. So you just said that so the lab question goes even further down and you get 20 okay. family line questions? I'm just okay. joking. Okay. Okay, here's your next one. Uh, can one do a self-deliverance where must someone else pray for them for demonic deliverance to occur? Yeah, so tomorrow in our second session tomorrow, uh, I'll, I'll deal more with how demons can gain access. And so questions about deliverance, I'm, I'm not trying to put this question off, but um, I'll deal more with the deliverance piece tomorrow. Um, so it would be more natural but to answer it then. But let me, let me just say this. There is a sense in which um, Christians can pray for their own deliverance and, 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 and deliver themselves. I mean, it's right in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from the evil one. So clearly that's the case. There are demonization of, of individuals is on a scale, okay? And in, in, in minor forms of demonization, um, you can probably do it yourself. Because we all get afflicted or inflicted or oppressed or invaded or harassed uh, at different times. And so we can, we can do that ourselves. Or we can do that just as we pray together with others. But then there are times where, where the demonization is, is more acute, it's more embedded, uh, it's more of an invasion into a person's life. And the demonic may feel that it has rights, privileges, grounds to be there. And so is very, very stubborn. And so in those cases, uh, a Christian, an individual, will need the help of others to see them released. Now, I'm just there's, gonna, no, there's no hard and fast rule. I'm going to give a, a connection to that question. Because um, I'm not entirely, I mean, it might be a Christian who asked that question. Mm -hmm. But it could be somebody who's not a follower of Christ who asked the question. So, mm. if you're, for your, your Muslim friend, your Buddhist neighbor, um, can well, they cast the demon out themselves, or do they need help? I'm just, just in case the question didn't come from a Christian. Yeah, well, I, I would say they need to call on the name of the Lord. It is the Lord Jesus who can set people free. Now, we know, like, for example, in the, in the, in the book of Acts, there were, there were exorcists at Ephesus right. who were not believers. And, uh, and Jesus even said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, if I, they, they accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beel, Beelzebub. And, and Jesus said, well, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, who are your people casting them out by? So clearly they were involved in exorcisms too. So they were not believers and they had some success, it seems, in, in casting out demons. So I'm not saying you have to be a Christian, but if you really want to be set free and you want to be permanently set, set, set free, there is only one who can do that, and that is Jesus Christ. So there has to be some Christian involvement. There has to be some calling on the name of the Lord. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a part of our powerful message to people who are bound by evil spirits and other religions. Your other religions aren't doing it for you. Jesus Christ can. <laughs> by the way, I don't know how to get rid of questions from this, but I'll, it'll eventually sort itself out. How do demons enter people? Okay, well, I'm, I am going to put that off until, until tomorrow. Come I'm, tomorrow, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I am going to, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to, the, the second session tomorrow, I'll deal with entry points. And, uh, and I think that will answer the question then. And then if, if there's more that needs to be said at that point, we can do it in the, the, uh, the Q&A then. Okay, uh, this is maybe a similar type of question. If you want to bat it to, to tomorrow, that's okay. fine. Cool. And, uh, and once again, if he does bat it to tomorrow and you don't, uh, you want more in his answer, you can, of course, ask the question tomorrow. Uh, if you are born again, uh, can demons, a demon or demons, still live within you? Yeah. Um, it'd be better to deal with that tomorrow. But um, <clears throat> I think um, this, is the biggest, this is the biggest question that people have. This is the one that perplexes people the most. Um, I mean, we, we think, and rightly so, the Holy Spirit is within us. And so how could an evil spirit dwell with the Holy Spirit? But I think, I think we have to kind of step back a bit and, and, and look at this from a different angle. Um, 
God is omni, omnipresent. So God's around sin all the time. God's around demons all the time. He's an omnipresent God. And um, there's no place that demons can go to get away from God because he's omnipresent. So there, there's an assumed logic in the position you have the Holy Spirit, therefore you could not get a demon. But you have to think beyond that, and you have to think of, 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 who, of who God is and how powerful God, God is. And you have in the book of Job, for example, Job, uh, Satan goes right into the presence of God, and he, he seeks permission from God to afflict Job. Um, so he, he has access. He is, he is there. So, uh, and the other thing is that we, we often think in three-dimensional terms, you know, uh, if God's got this, no one else can get in. <laughs> but we, we need to see it in a different way. When we're, when we're talking about the spirit world, we're, in a sense, we're not talking in, three -dimensional, in a three-dimensional world any, anymore. We're, we're talking in a, very, in a very different way. And I believe this, that the fact that the Holy Spirit is in a believer is actually... Um, and a demon can be present too, there's actually great hope in that because that means that the demon will never feel comfortable within the person who has the Spirit. In other words, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in one sense the first step in the deliverance of that person because he is going to do his sanctifying work in that person. He's going to lead that person into all truth. He is going to lead that person ultimately to be set free from an evil spirit that has taken up grounds there. The other thing I would say is that, um, and this is where we get confused with the word demon-possessed. People use this phrase, and I know it's in our English Bibles, but friends, you need to understand that the word possession is not found in the original. It's, it's not there. It's, a, it's, a, it's an English translation that is not a good, a good one. It goes all the way back to the authorized version and most English versions, modern translations have continued to use that word. Interestingly, some will say, well, it's, you know, a Christian can't be possessed, but they can be oppressed. But what's interesting is when you look at the New International Version, in some verses it says, and Jesus ministered to the demon possessed. But you go to the English Standard Version, it's the same verse, and it says, to the demon oppressed. So even the translators are using different words. So one uses possession, one uses oppression, so it gets very, very confused. What you need to see, is, see it as this. A Christian belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus holds the deed of ownership to you. He possesses you. The Holy Spirit possesses you. He controls you. He has ownership of you. Is it possible for a demon to come in because of squatter rights? Unfortunately, yes. But he doesn't possess you. He doesn't own you. He can invade you. He can inhabit you. It's like you buy, a, you buy this beautiful century-old home, and it looks fantastic, and you move in, but you get down in the basement, and you discover in the basement there's just some cracks in the, found, the, found, the foundation, and there are rats living in those cracks. Okay, they don't own the house, but they're intruders, and they are there. And so you have to deal with them at that, at that level. So we need to get this possession thing out of our mind, and we need to, we need to just see this as a, a very fluid thing. Jesus owns you. The Holy Spirit owns you. You are the temple of God, but even the temple can be invaded. When the Nazis moved into France, never once did Adolf Hitler say, never once did he say that France belonged to the German people. He never said that. Now, he... He said that about the people in the eastern part of Europe, that this, this was going to be German land, but he never said that about the French. But the Nazis occupied France. But they never owned France. And eventually it took a little battle to get the Nazis out. And that's the same thing that we're talking about here. Does that make sense? Make, makes a lot of sense. And uh, I'll just add one little thing. It's uh, sort mm -hmm. of uh, paraphrasing... Um, Churchill, we actually don't really entirely understand what a human being is. Uh, in some ways, a human being is a riddle wrapped in a 
mystery buried in an enigma. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we act as if we know exactly yeah, what me, human beings are. Let me, let me say one other, one other thing, thing there. When we come to Christ, we receive a new nature, but we still have our old nature, the, the sinful nature, the flesh. The Holy Spirit chooses to dwell in my body, <laughs> yes. which is corrupted in, Paul says, in my flesh dwells no good thing. As a sinner, I am totally depraved. Sin has touched every part of my humanity, but God, the Holy Spirit, still chooses to live in me in spite of the sin that is still dwelling within me. So why can we accept that but not accept that there can be an evil spirit? It doesn't make sense. The logic isn't, isn't there. I could just see them clicking all the new questions from that. No, I'm just joking. Here's yeah. a, this is a very a perennial question, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've had to, to deal with it and think about it. Uh, how does one discern between mental illness and demonization, whatever the, the word, or use demonization for now? How, do, how does one discern? Well, tomorrow I, I'll, I'll share a number of experiences of, 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 that I've had personally. I did that with the pastors this morning. I think I shared six different experiences six different stories, that, I, yeah. that I've had. And I haven't had a lot. Um, there are some pastors who've had many, way more than me. Don't consider myself an expert at all. But um, when, when I'm with someone who's, uh, I'll give an example. There was a, a young woman. She was very, very distraught and very emotional. And... Um, and she was talking about all kinds of things. And I just said, can I pray for you? And she said, sure. And I started to pray. And as I prayed, she fell out of her chair. Her eyes rolled back. She started moaning. I don't think that's a mental illness. You know, something was going on there. It was, it was a demon. And, and so um, in some cases, demons remain hidden, and, you, and it's kind of hard to discern. But if you go through the spiritual history of a person and you find that, that there are those entry points, which we haven't gotten into tonight, but we will tomorrow, if, if there are entry points in that person's life that you can discern as you talk to them and they've got a mental illness or they think they do, but you see these entry points where possibly the demonic has gotten in, then you can, you can start to walk them through prayers of renunciation where they, they renounce occult activity, they renounce the sins of their forebears that were involved in all these negative spiritual stuff and paganism and witchcraft and all that. And as you start walking them through that, if they have demons, it'll, it'll, it'll become clear. It'll become, it'll become clear. If they don't, and you still walk them through those prayers, of course, nothing happens or whatever, then okay, maybe there's a mental illness there too that's causing the depression or whatever it is. Uh, my wife was seriously depressed for three years. And, um, you know, if, if it had been a demon, just, just a demon, man, we, that'd be great. Because you can get rid of a demon pretty fast, but it just didn't work that way. It wasn't, you know, we had Christians say things to us. Our former pastor challenged her about sin in her life, and this brought the depression on. It was a very difficult thing for us to accept. Now, I don't have any doubt that when my wife was depressed, there were moments where Satan took advantage of that and, and kind of tried to energize that and really the devil kicks people when they're down. He's very evil. He's very evil. So I don't doubt that, but the root of it was not uh, demonic at all. And, you know, it was just good old-fashioned patience and doing the right things and exercising and getting the time for herself that she needed and getting the rest that she needed under the guidance of a, of a good counselor and a good physi physician, and she was set free of that, not because it was demonic. So I, th I think when you work with people and pray with people and you start to explore, okay, is this demonic? Let's, let's pray about this. Let's ask the Lord. Let's, let's renounce things and see what happens. The Lord will make it clear. I'm, I'm going to give another follow-up. Mm -hmm. to push, push you on this a little bit. And I, I'm not at all dismissing the seriousness, seriousness of the depression. Uh, but there are um, you know, schizophrenia, like there's a, a range mm -hmm. of other types of mental illness which are quite a sure. certain degree you know, stronger. And um, I'd like to, so I think that there'd be a bit of a question about that yeah. as well. What do you, do you think about that? Are those yeah. things real? Are they demonic? Or what do you... Well, I'm, I'm trying I'm, to get the question. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing the questioner is also thinking of that. Yeah, I, I am the least educated 
of all pastors on these matters, really. I, um, I'm not a medical doctor. I, I, don't un- I don't understand that. So I don't really feel qualified. But I would say this, that there are, there is schizophrenia that is mental disorder. Mm-hmm. And their demons can also do the same. Mm-hmm. And um, we dealt with one young woman, and this wasn't schizophrenia, but we dealt with a, a woman who had demons, and she'd been abused as a child, and she was very terribly spiritually abused in a church. And um, it's a very terrible thing that happened to her, but I, I, I won't get into that. Anyway, we were dealing with some demons, and then all of a sudden, um, um, she started to talk like a little child. And my first thing that came to my mind was, oh, okay, this demon's just trying to talk like a little child. Please don't hurt me, you know, because he's trying to get away. And so I dealt with this demon like it was a child, like as a, as a child. And I was firm and commanding and so on. And nothing happened. And there was a shift in her eyes. And some, sometimes you see that shift in, your eye, in the person's eyes. You can tell that the demon is kind of take, taken over. Well, the shift happened, and I thought it was a demon, and it wasn't. She had what we call multiple personality disorder or dissociation dis, 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 disorder. In other words, her, because of the abuse, her, her soul was fractured. And there were different personal, personalities there. Now, the problem, and this I felt way out of my depth, was that there were demons also attached to the altar personalities. All right. And uh, so I don't have experience in that. I, and, and she was, there was one other guy afterwards, and I took him to another counselor who was way more experienced in that. Um, my time as a pastor is limited, and I would say to pastors here, if you get caught up in this, unless God is really calling you full-time into a ministry of this, this, this nature... This, this will suck the time out of your week, you know. You won't have time for sermon prep or evangelism or visiting the sick in hospitals and other things. You just, it, it'll take up tons and tons of time. But at that point, it was clear to me that this was, this was the fractured personality. It was mental illness. And I found out the hard way. I actually, I hurt her. Hmm. I hurt her. Because I spoke to a child like you would speak to a demon. And I realized I had, and I, I asked for her, uh, forgiveness in doing that, and she she understood, but it, I felt terrible at that point in time. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the, que- Actually, the question. Uh, but two two things. First of all, I, I think um, for all of us, it's it's really helpful to learn that you're not perfect. Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not being funny. I'm not being funny because uh, many people oh, won't try to even deal with anything unless they're perfect. Oh no. And oh. You, you, you like we're all duffers. Like yeah. okay. So, and then just maybe the one other thing, we'll get to the next question, and it's still with this. Uh, I, I take it you'd say then probably like you would with um, some other illness, uh, go through the medical routes first, and if there's still nothing there, let's have a look to see if it's demonic. Would that sort of be your general type of practice, even if somebody's showing Generally, yes. multiple personality disorders is something like yeah. bipolar or something, you'd say, let's That's right. deal with these, look at these things medically first. And yeah. I think so. Okay. Um, there would be some except, exceptions right. to that, you know. Especially if you know their history. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah, in a general sense, yes, but not, not always. Okay. Well, this one, you, you might bat till tomorrow. It's up, I, I, in fact, I'm guessing you will, but I'll still give it because it has 10 thumbs up. Have you experienced exorcism? Uh, sorry, I guess what, okay, not have you been ex- have had an exorcism. I think what they mean is have you performed exorcism? exorcisms, and if so, how long uh, did the exorcisms have to go on? I think that's the intent of the question, not whether yeah, you had yeah. the exorcism. Well, the answer is yes. Um, uh, I don't normally use that word, but we right. talk about deliverance more, but, but I guess in the I have to popular, read their question. Yeah, um, in the popular usage of how we describe those things, yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, my first experience was with a, uh, a woman, a uh, young woman from Guyana who was uh, East Indian background, uh, grew up in a Hindu home, and she had 14 demons. And I had never, I, I had knowledge of what to do because I'd been a missionary in the Philippines and there were Filipinos who I worked with and American missionaries who I had worked with who had had some experiences in dealing with the demonic. So I got some teaching and some groundwork and we knew we lived in an animistic culture and so on. So 
I kind of had a general idea. But when this happened, it just happened. And so I'd never done it before. So me and my associ associate, uh, basically it was seven hours to deal with four 14 demons. And, um, and I've learned a lot since then. Um, and we haven't had anything go that long before or since. Not that it couldn't, but it, it's been much shorter. The quickest one I had happen was a, a woman, um, um, her name was Gay, and um, she responded to an invitation of the gospel in a Sunday morning service. And we, you know, it was just like the old Billy Graham style, people come to the front. And, <laughs> and, and we took about 10 or 11 people into our counseling room, which was off to the side. And I had met with her on a number of different occasions and she, um, she kind of was antagonistic to me and yet drawn to me at the same, the same time. She'd leave church every week mad of the things that I said, but she kept coming back. And she, was, she seemed perfectly normal. So people came, they went off to the side room. I went under the foyer to start counseling or to just to start mingling with, with people. And someone came running to me and said, John, you're needed in the counseling room immediately. So I went there and uh, one of our deacon's wives had, was sitting there with her and the deacon's wife said to me, there's something wrong. I don't know what, what to do. So I sat down in front of Gay and I said, tell me what's up. And she said, I really want to believe in Jesus and I'm trying to call out to him. But as soon as I start to call out and say, Jesus, something happens and I can't do it. And I just said to her, have you been to a fortune teller? And her eyes got real big and it was like, I could tell. Bingo, the nail had been hit right on the head. So we took her into my office. Her aunt came with her, um, and uh, I started to pray. She fell out of the chair. She, she screamed. My associate came into the room, and he walked into the room, and he said, and I shared this with the pastors this morning who were here. My associate is a pastor in, Ed, in Ed, Edmonton now, but he walked in the room, and he... If I looked at him to kind of explain what was going on. It was like he knew immediately, and he just shouted out, be still and know that I am God. And I first, my first thought was, well, that's kind of audacious of you. To, you walk in the room and say, be still and know that I'm God. And honestly, he said that, and bang, she got up, and she said, I'm free. I believe. It's gone. It was just that fast. It was so fast. And she described it to us that she had a, she believed she had a deceiving religious spirit. She got involved in for, with fortune telling. She'd gone to psychic fairs, all, all the stuff with fortune telling. And she believes that the demon was leading her into different religious and spiritual experiences as a counterfeit to true salvation in Christ. And the moment she heard, be still and know that I'm God, she realized, I'm striving. She stopped striving. She believed she was set free immediately. It, it, we didn't even have to command the demon to go. It just, it just happened. That happened in like a couple of minutes. So that was really fast. And it'd be, it'd be wonderful if they were all like that. <laughs> yeah. But they're not, unfortunately. Um, boy, there's three here which are tied. Uh, this is going to go in a bit of a different direction. If, if I keep going on these demonized questions, I won't have anything to say tomorrow. You, well, you can just say punt. You I, can say you okay, can pay. You, okay. uh, you know, but um, unless you really want to avoid the lab question, by the way. So I'm just joking. You. Yeah. I hope they ask it tomorrow because we will ask. We will talk about that. Okay. Science and, and demons. Um, oh, here I said that they all had ten, and then people voted, messing me up. Uh, did de Oh, here it is. Do demons only operate in individual lives, or are they behind? or included in, or whatever, oppressive political structures, racism, abusive institutions, false ideologies, etc., etc. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this world. He is the one who has deceived the whole world, Revelation 12. So you take all those verses. He has blinded the minds of those who don't believe the gospel. You take all those verses and you realize, you know, he, he, he offered to Jesus the kingdoms of this world. And, um, and that's why Jesus came. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, in Daniel, you've got this conflict in Daniel 10 that goes on with an angel and a, and a high spirit being. And, 
And so and Daniel's praying. So there's something that's going on in the heavenly realms. And yes, I mean, when we see, I mean, who could not believe that there weren't demons involved in the rise of Nazism in the 1930s? I mean, it was demonic. Hitler had control spirits. He was able to control people and crowds. I think he was a highly demonized person. And, uh, and so a whole system was put in place. Anything that degrades human beings, anything that attacks people as the image of God, is demonic at its core. The d demons are influencing that. Hatred, racism, whatever. Um, it's all a denial of who we are as image bearers of God. And so the devil's at work in our world. And that's why I said in the opening words tonight was that the premise I'm working on is the evil in this world, both personal to us and at large in the world, cannot be explained on a human level only. It's because of the demonic. So just a, once again, a, a bit of an ad, ad, addendum to that mm -hmm. question. Um, how do you pray into that or do you pray into that? Well, yeah, I, I, I think even the Lord's Prayer itself, uh, um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. What are we praying for? The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, you know, read Revelation 21 and 22. Revelation 21 and 22 talk about what the new heaven and the new earth is full of and what it is free of. Right. And it's full of a lot of things, and they're great things. And it's free of a lot of things. No crying, no mourning, no pain. Uh, the former things are passed away. And what precedes the new, the new heaven, the new earth? Revelation 20, and the devil was cast into the lake of fire. And the words of our Lord Jesus into the eternal fire prepared for them. Oh, that's going to be a great, great day when the devil is cast into the lake of fire. So I'm starting to preach now. I'm, I'm getting away from the question, George. <laughs> but um, we pray your kingdom come. That is a prayer in which we pray against these types of things. And it can be more specific than just thy kingdom come. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm, there's certain individuals in in Canadian political life, I'm praying God will bring them down. Amen. I am. Right. So it's both individuals and institutions as and well. Institutions, right. sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the beast in the book of Revelation. Oh, sure. It's, and, it's, sure. And, and look what's happening. I, I, okay, I'm going to say it. Look, <laughs> look, look what's happening in our educational system today. I mean, I, I was, we were in Frankfurt, Ontario last night. A little public school, a little town of no more than 500 people. And there's a LGBTQ flag flying at the pub, public school, and I'm going, like, we got to pray. We have to pray that down. Yes. Um, now we may not we may not see it happen because God may choose to give Canada what it actually deserves, Amen. what we actually deserve, um, and we deserve more of this confusion. We deserve more of this deception because we have abandoned God. But I'm, I'm praying that God will turn it around. I'm praying God will bring it down. And, and, and if it doesn't happen now, I know it's going to happen at the second coming. And, um, and you know, you read those passages in, in Rev, Revelation, you know, the, the heavens, you know, hallelujah, you know. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the The earth will the be Lord. filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God amen. speed the day. Yes. Yeah. yeah, amen. How concerned should uh, we be about spells or curses or objects in our possession? Um, very concerned. Um, um, you might want to say a few things about each of them. Spells, uh, I think it's yeah, kind of taken away, but spells, spells are specifically mentioned in Revel or Leviticus chapter 19 with divination, sorcery, mediums, the one who casts spells. Uh, I guess another way of putting that is cast, casting curses on people. People who deal in the occult are, they're controlling the spirit world to their end, to their own personal end. And so um, it's possible for an individual to place a curse or a spell on someone uh, by manipulating dark, dark powers. And if that happens to a believer or a servant of God, there's certainly ways of dealing with that. But it's it's real. It's real. 
um, the question, the rest, the way the rest of the question. So basically, how concerned should we be? We should be very, very concerned, and that's why we pray on the armor of God. That's why we 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 pray the Lord Jesus will protect us from the flaming arrows of the evil one. That may be a part of what the flaming arrows are. The flaming arrows are probably all kinds of them, different kinds. But we should be praying on that protection that the Lord Jesus gives us. And um, so, um, before we get to objects, so if you were dealing with a witch doctor. How intimidated would you be by him or her? I wouldn't be intimidated. Um, How come? Because you just said they could send curses or spells your way. Yeah, but I, I, can, I can immediately, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, render those things null and void. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that some people won't be affected by it. We, I, we, we know of, of, of missionaries where illness has, has come into their home. Um, and it was all because of evil spirits, people placing curses, or idols had been in the home before, and, and that happened, and they had to suffer for a while. But, but there's a way of breaking those things. Once you know what's going on, you, you have to confront those things. And uh, those powers can be, can be broken. Right. So, yeah, I'm not afraid, but at the same time, I, I don't want to be stupid. Right. Yeah. A lot of stupid people out there, George. I look in the mirror, so I, I understand that problem. <laughs> uh, we're going to get to, um, to objects. So basically, there were spells and curses, and then objects. Should you be concerned about objects in your possession, in your house? Well, yes. Um, demons, it's something we don't understand, but demons can attach themselves to physical objects. I was speaking to a brother this morning and he was talking about someone who's had some influence of Buddhism and he definitely has a demon, but he's not given up his little statue of Buddha yet. And, 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 and he was just talking about, you know, we got so far with him. And I said, I said to him, I said, well, that's probably the issue. He has to destroy that thing. And if you go to Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus, mm -hmm. you know, those who had practiced the magical arts, they brought all those things it was an awakening that happened, and, and they burned them all. Um, and so Israel was told to take down the Asherah poles and the shrines to Baal, to Baal. Baal is the correct way of saying it. And they had to smash those things and burn, and burn them. And um, we need to destroy those physical ob objects, be they images, idols, amulets, rings, um, any kind of thing Ouija associated. boards. Ouija boards, all that kind of thing. Um, some Freemasons have rings and they pass them on to their grandkids. You might really have real affection for your grandfather and you don't want to get rid of that ring, but you need to be really careful about that because many Freemasons are dedicating their offspring to, <clears throat> to the god of the Freemason Lodge. And, um, and, and there can be demons that are connected with those objects. When we were in the, Phil the Philippines, we would not baptize any con convert unless they had destroyed their, Im their images. And we would have services where, uh, usually outside, where we would destroy them and burn them, and we would sing and pray and praise, praise God together. And then it was our joy to baptize them right, right after that. We wanted to make sure that if they were baptized in the name of the triune God, that they had completely renounced all the works of Satan. And that, that was the practice that we, that we had. So, yeah, we need to get, to get rid of those kinds of things. Actually, some, some baptismal practices even today ask the question, have you renounced Satan? Have you renounced Satan? That's right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing with a man right now in Ottawa. My wife and I are meeting with him and his wife, and we really feel there was something the Lord brought to his attention, and I won't tell you what it was, but the Lord brought it to his attention that he probably needed to get rid of it. And we came back a week later, and he, and he hadn't. And he really struggled with it. And he's struggling mm -hmm. still with it. So <laughs> we're trying to be patient with him and, um, and work with him. But um, I just have a feeling that we're not, that could be a part of why we're not seeing a, break, a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but yeah. Actually, just, uh, I'm going to read the other question. This is just a bit of an advertisement uh, for Dick and Delve and for One Way Ministries and and for, your, and for your, uh, the churches, those of you who are connected to churches, uh, we need uh, more prayer team members for Dig and Delve. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, even if we're not talking about demonic things, but, uh, 
you know, in the next talk that we're in the next event with, you know, Paul Copin, you know, about people misinterpreting the Bible to make it look like, in a sense, God is a demon, is really how they're interpreting the Bible. I mean, that's a power encounter. So if you would like, uh, if, if it's put on your heart to contact us to be part of a prayer team, that would be uh, really greatly appreciated. And, um, and then pray for your pastor as well, mm -hmm. churches on Sundays. Uh, that they would have the courage uh, to talk about certain things because uh, the devil can really uh, beat you up. Yeah, right? yeah. John, do you want to share about that, about getting beaten up by the devil about well, certain topics and stuff? Not, not beaten up. but, no, but that's, I'm exaggerating. No, but let me, let me share. When, I, when we went to West Highland Church, we'd been at Morningstar for 18 years, and you need to understand that prior to that, we were members of Morningstar for, I was, for 18 years. That was our church for 36 years. And so we left and we went to, Ham to Hamilton. It was very hard. And what really I found difficult when I started pastoring in Ham Hamilton is I'd come home on a Sunday after I'd preached, and I'd say this to my wife, and she knows. I said, I, gotta, I, I was preaching to a barrier mm. today. Yeah. I, I just sensed there was a barrier. I can't explain it. I just... Um, I remember I did a series on marriage. I did six <laughs> sermons on marriage. The role of the woman, the role of the man. And I, I, I was reluctant to do the series because usually when you talk about marriage and all of a sudden there's going to be people who are coming for counseling and I just didn't want to get overburdened with counseling. <laughs> I preached for six weeks and I really preached my guts out. Not one person in a church of 800 came to be counseled. Not one. No one approached me at all. And I remember, just remember thinking... I can't believe that everybody in this church has got good <laughs> marriages. Like, it, it, it just it didn't make sense to me. And I felt like I was preaching to this wall. And so we gathered some people, and we met on a, on a Saturday night from 7.30 to 8.30. Just formed a, a circle of chairs, and we just prayed for the preaching of the Word of God on Sunday morning and the worship of God's people, that God would take away whatever it is, and that there would be a freedom. And when we left... Back in June, for the last number of years of our, my ministry there, it's just been a joy to mm -hmm. preach the word yeah. and just people soaking it up and people have come to Christ and it's just been good. So the Lord broke that down. So that wasn't a demon in a person, but that was demons, I think, that were just stopping. There was something in the church. Um, um, are we supposed to be at 9 or 9.30? Yeah. Nine thirty? About nine o five, I think. Nine o five. Well, just yeah. until uh, until uh, <laughs> well, or, when John wilts or nine thirty, whatever comes first. So, uh, um, well, actually, if we just keep going, I can tell you everything I'm going to say tomorrow, and nobody has to come back. How's that? <laughs> no, they want to come back. Listen, there's lots of questions here, dude. Oh, like, boy. look at that. It just keeps going and going and going. So uh, you're stuck. Okay. Uh, and this is, a, this is a bit of a complex question, but it's a very, very good question. And um, I've noticed you're not afraid to step on toes a little bit, so you might have to do a few things here with this, because the question is, do you consider any types of, in quotes, folk Christian practices, sort of like similar to there's folk Islam. They say versus, but I think they mean similar to that there's folk Islam. Um, do you think there's a type of folk Christian practices uh, reveal an implicit animism that has snuck into Western Christianity. So basically, I think they're asking the question, is there folk Christ Christianity in Canada? Mm. I think that's the heart of the question. If, they've got, if I got that wrong, just send another question. But, uh, or if you don't like his answer, send another question. We'll just keep <laughs> banging away at it. So, um, There are not things that, that stand out blatantly to me. But inasmuch as there may be people in our churches who, for example, uh, come and worship Jesus in the week, but then they, they, they play around with Ouija boards, they, they go to a fortune teller, uh, they're reading their horoscope on a daily basis, things of that nature. Um, they're either doing it because they're ignorant of that, maybe the word's not being made clear, um, but if they are doing that, then that in a sense would be a form of animism uh, that is a part of their lives which shouldn't be. 
Um, they're not loving the Lord, the God, with all their soul, all their strength. They're not seeking God himself and God alone for their future, for their life, for their needs. Um, I would say that if there is a fault in the evangelical church um, along this line, it would be this, that quite often our preaching and our teaching is focused on ultimate concerns. How do you go to heaven? How do you get your sins forgiven so you can go to heaven? Um, and so we'll preach a lot, like, for example, justification by faith and grace alone through Christ alone. It's all good stuff. But I would say that while that touches the hearts of people and, and we must never lose that emphasis in our preaching, I think that some evangelical preaching doesn't address the everyday concerns that people are going through because they're bound by evil spirits. And I think we need, we need to keep that correct theology of the gospel and we need to add to it the fact that Jesus is there for everyday concerns. He not only can set you free from your sin and forgive you from your sin, he can set you free from the powers of evil. And I don't think that's, I think we're imbalanced. And, um, and so I think, I think there needs to be more of an emphasis on that. Because that's where the folk Christianity thing starts. It's people's everyday concerns. It's how do I navigate this world and the spirit world now? Um, and they, they need to see Jesus as not just the Savior from sin, but the Savior from Satan. Uh, John, I just, um, before we go to the next question, I really appreciate that you answered that. Uh, you didn't say, well, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and mainline Protestants, you spoke as an evangelical. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that you, you, you looked yeah. within your own tribe, my, yeah. our own tribe, so to yeah. speak, rather than outside. Yeah. If people want to ask follow-up questions around some of that, uh, that you're free to do it. Uh, we'll ask a couple more questions. We're starting to lose people, which is fine because it's late. How, um, you're starting uh, to lose me, brother. How, <laughs> um, I'm going to get... Um, do I have two volunteers here to prop up his arms? <laughs> <laughs> so you just keep going, brother. No, mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. And there's tomorrow as well. Um, this has been very rich. And uh, John and I haven't decided yet. We're going to play it a little bit by ear, whether we have... Uh, him talk in the morning, then the Q&A time, then he talks in the Q&A, or whether we'll have a talk, a break, there'll be a break, there's always going to be a break, uh, or whether we'll do a talk, uh, then another talk with a break in between, and then a longer q we'll, we'll figure that out. We'll see how, is, how, how it's going. I know where I'm leaning now. You're like <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Well, we're going to end at 9.15, I think, because this has been, a, uh, as a person who also has to speak up front, it, that's sure. all, you've done a lot of talking. Yeah. Uh, how do we get power to fight demons or to deliver possessed people? Or is that, are you going to talk about that more tomorrow? Yeah, I think that that might come up tomorrow. I, I, just to say initially that it's not a matter of getting a power, it's a matter of using the power God has already given to us. We're in Christ, we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ, far above all these things. Uh, there has already been given to uh, the servants of Christ a certain degree of authority. Uh, we do this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a, it's not a matter of, I, I, I gotta find this thing, I gotta seek it out and find it. It's, you know, it's there, it's there. And um, be strong in the Lord. Um, Ephesians 6, and in his mighty power, Paul says. So it's, it's just a matter of recognizing that that strength and that power is there, you know. So, so two, uh, what are two follow-up questions to, to go with that? Mm -hmm. the, the, this, the next one is, because um, uh, you, you've been focusing on you doing this and you doing this and you doing this, although you have mentioned others coming in. So do you want to just comment a little bit about because I think it's connected to the question, the role of the broader church community in, in this type of ministry. Do you have any thoughts about that? I think it's connected, because it's not yeah. just a matter of me, right, having that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, so, no, for sure. And if I... And, and, and with that, do you think some people have special gifting in okay. this? 
Yeah, and if I conveyed the idea that it, you know it's me, I, you know, please understand. No, I know you haven't, but I just no, want to make no. sure you clarify it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, I, I think churches need to have teams of individuals to deal with this, and I think there are certain giftings that the, the Holy Spirit gives, and um, and um, and and the Lord leads people into these kinds of things. As a pastor, we had a team at our church that had kind of an inner healing ministry that went on, and we felt that. That I never got, I never got um, dragged into that, unless I was absolutely needed. That they needed to have a pastor there because there was something demonic. Right. Um, and I thought that was really helpful to me. So we had this sort of outbreak thing that happened in the first few years, and then we went for years without anything, and because we had this team dealing with stuff. So um, uh, there's an, an, an excellent book that John Thompson has written. John Thompson is the pastor of Sanctus Church in Ajax. The book is called Deliverance. And John deals, uh, he's written another book on gifts, but he deals with that team aspect thing and the way of dealing with things. So it's, I, I just had an incident just before we left, I guess a year before I left, of a, a young man from Haiti who, he just came to see me. He was very troubled. Anyway, it was very clear he had demons. But I shut the whole thing down because I was by myself. Uh, and I, I just felt... Let's ask could, you that question. Yeah, and I was pretty convinced it was voodoo uh, from the Haitian world thing, you know. And, and I just thought, I, 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 I need help. I'm not dealing with this on my own. Yeah, yeah. the Ephesians 6 uh, armor image, uh, the, the, they fought in... It's a plural image. It's not it's an individual image. It's a plural image, image not yeah. a single image. Yeah, it's a corporate image. Yeah. And we, so we are all the body of Christ. And I, I, you know, getting back to the gifts, I think you can go through the ministry of Jesus and you can see, except for tongues and speaking in tongues, you can see in the ministry of Jesus every single one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Only tongues and speak, speaking in tongues and interpretation, you don't see that. But every other gift of the Spirit is there in the ministry of Jesus. And we are the body of Christ. So those gifts are there to be used. And so... This is a gift-based ministry, and it is a team ministry. But, but again, you can't say, well, I don't have the gift. I can't deal with this. No, right. I, I don't think Timothy had the gift of evangelism, and Paul said to him, do the work of an evangelist. Yeah. So um, I, I, I tried to model that a little bit in my opening prayer where I, I said to God, I don't have any authority in my flesh of myself, yeah. but I belong to Jesus, and yeah. that's, therefore I can pray this. Yep. Right. Uh, it's 914. You can answer this question. I'm just well, it, quick. Uh, are all temptations from demons? Let me deal with that tomorrow. Deal with that tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to just pronounce a bit of a blessing over us as we're all about to leave? And, uh, sure. Uh, you, okay, you, can, you can applaud as well. That's fine. But... Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Why don't we just stand? For those of you who have to leave, that's fine. But, and John, if you just pronounce a bit of a prayer of blessing over us, that would be wonderful. Sure. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for the good discussion that we've had. We pray in the Lord Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will go with us from this place. And I pray that you will give us your rich blessing as we go. You'll keep us safe from all powers of the evil one. You'll bring us back tomorrow with joy in our hearts, ready to worship you and to learn more. And may the richest blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us all. Amen.